We'll just give it another two or three minutes and then get started. Okay, I think we'll get started now. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm Jackie Paré, Head of Programming for the Friends of the Larchmont Public Library. It's so nice to see so many of you on Zoom today. Uh, the first and one of the only times during the pandemic that I actually ventured indoors for a performance of any kind was to see a documentary called The Lost Leonardo in the tiny screening room of nearby Pelham Picture House. The film was, just as the critics are saying, captivating from start to finish. Very briefly, it's the story of a painting widely, but not unanimously attributed to Leonardo da Vinci that was purchased in 2005 for $1,175 and sold a dozen years later for a record $450 million to Saudi Arabia's crown prince. When the lights went out at the end of the movie, when the lights went on, it was as if someone had walked out of the screen and into the theater and that person was sitting right in front of me, our guest today, Evan Beard. A managing director and head of private business and global art services at Bank of America, Evan called The Lost Leonardo, in which he is featured, quote, the most improbable story that's ever happened in the art market. A former US intelligence officer and student of behavioral economics and luxury markets at Oxford, Evan is the perfect person to talk about the film and answer questions it raises about valuing and authenticating art, the controversial world of art restoration, and the thrilling and sometimes shadowy side of international art collecting. Hello, Evan. Hey, good to be here. If you have questions along the way, feel free to post them in the chat box, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. You can just hit it and start typing and we'll get to your questions. But before we start, let's take a look at the trailer. Uh, you can watch the documentary in full after this program on Amazon Prime, Stars, or Apple TV Plus. There are only about 15 Leonardo's known. To say I have found a picture like this is just so far-fetched. You're just going to look like a fool. This is the most improbable story that has ever happened in the art market. It's not even a good painting. So I find this painting that's cataloged as after Leonardo. The lost Salvatore Mundi, the savior of the world. For whatever reason, this picture attracts my attention. And we decided to buy it. The painting was very damaged and I removed some retouching. My hands are shaking. No one could have painted this except Leonardo. The joke was that that was a contemporary painting because 90% of it was painted during the restoration. Something's fishy here. But that's ridiculous. We have extensive technical analysis of the picture, infrared, new X radiography. It's been authenticated. Wow. Oh, God. <laughs> it should be Leonardo attributed. If it was by the hand of the master, then it would be exponentially upon exponentially more valuable. It was worth in excess of $200 million. This is the male Mona Lisa. You're now buying a global celebrity. Pour négocier ce tableau, j'utilisais un ami à moi qui est un ancien joueur de poker. C'est du jeu commercial. 
It's not about art and love. <laughs> it's about money. It's about transferring funds. Whenever there's a lot of money involved, the world becomes a bunch of worms intertwined. You can stick it in the desert and lure tourists. It's not just art history. It's world politics. Everybody was complicit in dreaming up lost Leonardo da Vinci. Nobody really cares what the truth is. 240 million. 300 million. 400 million. So this is the most expensive painting ever sold in the history of the art world. Where the hell is that painting? Nobody knows where it is. Okay, let me share my screen. Uh, let me get this up. Okay, and let me get it. Please feel free to send any um, um, questions via chat. We're going to you know, save a good bit of time towards the end with any questions you may have about you know, the film, uh, this crazy story. But I thought I'd you know, take you through what we think actually happened with this picture. Uh, it's a tangled story with some you know, interesting you know, bits and pieces to it. And then we can get into some questions at the end. Um, so you know, this picture, um, OK. We believe this picture uh, was made, well, we know it was made in the 1500s, and we, you know, Leonardo scholars place it at the time um, Leonardo was making the Mona Lisa. Uh, we believe that uh, he made this picture for either the Duke of Milan or perhaps while he was, uh, you know, with in Paris uh, making works for King Francis. We don't really know. Uh, what we do know is uh, that this picture at one point was cataloged as a Christ in the mode of God the Father um, in one of the, the collections um, of the Bourbon dynasty. Um, there's King Francis. Uh, we, we believe that this picture was in that collection. And like many dynasties, uh, you know, the, Bur the House of Bourbon and the Stuarts in England decided to forge an alliance uh, during, you know, some rough times on the continent. And uh, so Henrietta Maria marries Charles I in, you know, the early 1600s. And as some of you may know, Charles I's life did not end very well. He actually was beheaded and we entered an interregnum. We do believe that Henrietta Maria likely brought a group of pictures, um, very many pictures, including what we think was perhaps, you know, the picture that we're contemplating today. And that's how we think it landed um, in England, um, making its way across the English Channel. Uh, during the interregnum, Oliver Cromwell uh, oversaw, you know, the country. And interestingly, a lot of the pictures from King Charles' collection, and this picture was um, in one of the, uh, the archives as uh, head of Christ, and we were able to find that Robert Simon and his colleague, Robert Simon, you'll, you'll get to know later in the story, um, was able to uh, attribute or at least see that there was, it wasn't attributed to da Vinci, but there was a head of Christ with a globe which does describe this picture. Um, but the picture was pawned off and a lot of the King's collection uh, after um, you know, uh, Charles I was beheaded was sent to loan sharks essentially. So this picture likely spent much of uh, you know, the late 17th century as loan collateral until uh, you know, a lot of the King's debts were repaid. So this was very likely, you know, in an inventory, perhaps in a really rough place in London, um, you know, as the people were trying to get some money back uh, from the crown, uh, one of the early art loans in history. Somehow the picture ends up in the Buckingham collection. So it, it comes back in as the crown is restored. What very likely happened was a lot of the pictures, a lot of you know, the queen and king's collection um, from the House of Stuart ends up back into, uh, you know, the Buckingham collection and Buckingham House, you know, ultimately becomes the seat of the royal collection and the picture ends up in an archive, which we were able to decipher um, uh, 
calls Herbert Sheffield a, a baronet. Uh, not much more is known about him, but he sells in the catalog Head of Our Savior, Lot 53, by an Italian master. Again, even in the late 18th century, the picture is being sold not as a da Vinci, not even as a pupil of da Vinci, but some Italian master, and it sells for about two pounds. Uh, it, it's hard to actually sort of, you know, let's say roughly that's like, you know, fifteen to twenty thousand dollars today. So two pounds in the 18th century was something. It was not. Uh, so it's it's like buying a day sale picture at Christie's, one of the lesser valuable day sale pictures at Christie's not junk, um, but it's certainly not what this picture turns into later. The picture ends up after a series of acquisitions in the collection of a, a guy named uh, Robinson, who uh, you know, John Robinson was a noted esthete, uh, kind of a, a man who was a poet, a, a musician, a collector, one of the early British aristocratic uh, romantics who probably inherited a lot of money and was able to live a very genteel life and put together collections of books and manuscripts and maps and pictures. And somehow, you know, the picture ends up in his collection. Um, I like to show this from time to time. I think all collectors fall into one of these four categories. And what's interesting about this picture is over time, this picture ends up in landing in different categories of collectors. Uh, you have the connoisseur, the esthete, the enterprising collector, and the trophy hunter. Um, the enterprising collector being someone who's trying to collect pictures with an eye towards investment. The trophy hunter basically has legacy and power on their mind and is building a collection that will outlive them and sort of a symbol of their power the connoisseur, someone who goes very deep in one area, like an old master's collector, and it's really animated by knowledge and intellectual curiosity. And then the esthete, like Yves Saint Laurent, or someone who, uh, whose life needs to have sort of an aesthetic vibe to it. Um, so it's bought by this esthete, um, Robinson. And um, from there uh, is sold as it finally gets an actual attribution in 1900. The picture sold as a Bernardino Luini uh, to Sir Francis Cook. Sir Francis Cook's a British merchant, uh, one of the early British merchants and you know, builds an empire, um, a business empire uh, around cotton in the late uh, 19th century and becomes a pictures collector. Uh, and builds a great landed estate called Doughty House, um, which you can go to see today, it's been restored. So this is an example of the connoisseur, a man who's made his money and really becomes a noted old master's collector and is going back and you know, buying pictures uh, to hang at Doughty House. Um, there's Doughty House in Richmond, which is right outside of London. Um, so our picture would have hung in a gallery like this. Uh, uh, the, the house has great old masters pictures from the high renaissance, some great Dutch old masters, uh, you know, a lot of mannerist works and even got into some English uh, you know, landscape paintings. Um, but this picture spends most of the 20th century, the first half of the 20th century in what we would recognize as this genteel landed estate. Um, these, these landed estates during the 20th century became completely uneconomical. Uh, they just didn't work. Something happened in the United States that put them all out of business. And that something was we invented a very efficient way of, of harvesting wheat. And so suddenly the agricultural dividends that these big landed estates would pay their um, overseers, the aristocrats, the dukes and baronets and um, became completely uneconomical. The other thing is after the war, uh, actually even after World War I, the British passed a series of uh, you know, estate tax laws. So suddenly, even if you go with the uh, uh, primogeniture principle and give everything to the firstborn son as most British aristocrats do, it became very, very difficult to transfer wealth from one generation to the next. You had to pay the government so many of these landed estates fall on completely hard times. 
And this one, even during World War II, ended up being bombed uh, with the picture um, that we are discussing here, you know, surviving the bombing. And that's Doughty House during the mid 20th century, really in tough shape. Uh, it's been restored and I recommend, but you know, this is you know, the state of affairs here. So uh, like many aristocrats in the mid 20th century after the war, the money was in the new world in the United States. The class was in the UK. So you had a lot of wealthy Americans that were buying up pictures to show their genteelness, to show that they had made it. Um, and you know the British had pictures, the old world had pictures and the money was in the United States. So our picture uh, made its way into Sotheby's in 1958. Uh, and it's, it's sold as a Boltrafio, lot 40. Um, this was a picture that Kenneth Clark, who did the first major monograph of Da Vinci, we know he attended this auction and we know he probably reviewed this picture. Um, and interestingly, it escaped his gaze. He did not find it interesting enough to buy it for 45 pounds, which today, again, we're talking a few thousand dollars in today's money, not worth. And it was, it was sold um, basically as a group of broader pictures, one of the minor works from the Cook Collection uh, at Sotheby's. There it was at the time, it looks like sort of a hippie with a beard, not an attractive picture. Um, and, you know, it, it sells to the Kuntz family. The Kuntz family uh, run a, um, a small furniture store in New Orleans in the St. Charles Hotel. Uh, you know, classic American story, German immigrants, they begin in making a little bit of wealth, selling their furniture in a budding metropolis like New Orleans as it's transitioning from an agricultural economy to an industrial one. They get wealthy, they summer in London, and they buy you know, a very minor picture to come hang in their home in Baton Rouge. So our picture spends the second half of the 20th century and really up to 2005 in the worst possible environment for a Renaissance picture on wood panel, basically in the swamp in Baton Rouge, in a uh, in a a stairwell uh, with really terrible humidity, and there it stayed of all places in the world for what we think is a Da Vinci in the home of Basil Clovis Henry Senior, who is a descendant of uh, the Kuntz family. Uh, so Basil Henry Senior dies in two thousand five. And he calls Christie's, well, his descendants call Christie's and say, would you take a look at our pictures? Would you take a look at this picture? Uh, Christie's comes down, reviews the works and says, none of this for me, send it to the local auction house. We don't want it. It's not an interesting picture for us. Uh, we think you'll do better sending it to the now defunct St. Charles Gallery in New Orleans. Um, so there you see it, the estate of Basel C. Henry, um, interestingly sold right after um, the effects of Trent Reznor, who happened to be the front man of Nine Inch Nails, the industrial uh, hard metal band who you may be familiar with. Um, an interesting place to find a Leonardo da Vinci. There it is. Uh, it, it is sold and cataloged as after Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, Attribution is very confusing. So you have by Leonardo, you have attributed to, which is a notch down. You have a follower of Leonardo or a pupil of Leonardo. Um, this is none of those. This is after, meaning a late copier likely did this in the artist's style. Um, it sells with an estimate of $1,200 to $1,800. And it's bought very quietly at the time for $1,100 and $65. Um, this did not make a splash anywhere in the art world. And it's bought by, um, oh, let me go back. It's bought by two dealers who call themselves sleeper hunters. Um, a guy named Robert Simon, a, a old master's dealer in New York City, and his partner at the time from London, uh, Alexander Parrish. They buy this thing, they bring it back to New York City, they take it to uh, Diane Modestini, who you see here, 
a great conservation uh, artist, and they take all the overpaint off, all the bad retouching that had happened over hundreds of years, and they find that this is literally in three pieces. You can see the knot down on the belt on the piece, the, the picture's in really, really tough shape. If you see the back of it, it had a lot of holes from the worms and it, it had infestations. This was very close to basically being lost to history. Uh, you, you could tell it's been through war. It's been in really bad um, you know, uh, you know, placements throughout the years. But the other thing you saw is this was done by a much better artist than what it was sold as. So Diane Modestini, you know, they, they, they do the conservation work and um, you know, she does a very nice job on it and they take it to the National Gallery where things really get interesting. But before we go there, I, I want to ask you all, do you believe that art is, when you look at a work of art, is it primarily an intellectual experience or an aesthetic experience? Could you just sort of type in when you're looking at a work of art, are you having an intellectual experience or an aesthetic experience? I'm seeing aesthetic come up first here. Anyone else? Aesthetic, a lot of people saying aesthetic. Um, so yeah, I, we all believe and like to believe and think that when you're we're, we're looking at a work of art, it's really an aesthetic experience that we're ha having. Um, I think it may be a little bit of both, but perhaps maybe even more intellectual than we may think. This is a picture by Franz Halls that was sold a few years ago at Sotheby's for $10 million. It was bought by a great collector in Seattle. He hung it, tried a place in his living room, and he held a cocktail party after he bought it. I went to this cocktail party and people were in the home, people who were curators at great museums, people that were really noted old masters collectors, they all were having a moment with this picture. They were celebrating this picture. They were going up and explaining, you know, the great Franz Halls, the Dutch master that was an early, you know, early impressionist. Look how, you know, the strokes are so, uh, you know, uh, wide. And, you know, this really opened the door to Monet because he was so, and people were having a great moment. Um, we get back from that party and not a few days later, we discovered that you know, this picture was, you know, painted just a few years prior. This is a very late fake, uh, certainly not by Franz Hals. It's certainly not a Dutch master. Um, but this picture that we were all having a moment with and praising and having an aesthetic experience with was worth zero, not 10 million. Sotheby's did refund the collector. But interestingly, nothing happened from the moment we were all having that emotional experience with the picture to the moment it was worth nothing and no one wanted to have have anything to do with it. Literally nothing happened with the picture physically, biologically. The only thing that really changed was the expectations that we brought to the picture. Uh, our own belief that it was from the hand of the master, our own willingness to really buy into the mythology, our wanting to, you know, maybe it was wanting to not look, uh, you know, stupid at a party and not love this picture. Um, but it is interesting, you know, here's a, uh, a chair. Some people may believe that it's a nice chair. It's, you know, perhaps you'd spend 20,000, 30,000 on it. This sold for 28 million at Christie's. Now, why would a chair like this sell for $28 million? Uh, it's an important uh, chair by a noted designer, but still, um, the reason is this is a chair by Yves, or, or, that was owned by Yves Saint Laurent. There it is in Yves Saint Laurent's living room. Uh, whoever was buying that chair was buying the mythology of Z Yves Saint Laurent. They wanted to own a piece of the individual. So provenance matters as well. Um, you know, this is not something that was bought for utility reasons. This was bought for intellectual reasons. Uh, in a similar vein, the Mona Lisa was not a major picture. Here it is missing from the Louvre's wall in the early 20th century. I think it was stolen in 1906. It took people almost two and a half days at the Louvre to notice it was missing. This was a fairly minor picture by da Vinci. And it certainly wasn't the global icon or celebrity that it is today. Uh, it really did take a moment where uh, Jackie Onassis romanced uh, the culture minister Henri Malraux and brought the picture over in 1963 there it is in New York City with lines going down Fifth Avenue. 
people were coming uh, to see this picture. Warhol at the time said they could have just sent a copy because all these people are going to see this picture and they wouldn't have known the difference. And he said that, but the, the reality was people were not going to see the picture. They were going to have seen the picture. They wanted to be able to say, I saw the celebrity, I saw the icon. Uh, it was an intellectual experience. Uh, they were not going to have an aesthetic moment with this picture. Um, and you know, even today, to go see the Mona Lisa is an intellectual event. It's, it's being able to say, I did something. You can't get near it. It's, it's, it's a really terrible experience if you're in that room with tourists and their cell phones sort of overtaking their selfies. It's become almost a moment where you go sort of pay homage to a celebrity, an icon. Um, and we'll come back to this. So I make the point that, you know, this picture had a key moment, and this is in 2011. Robert Simon knows that he has something that no one's ever going to believe is a da Vinci. He, but he also is understanding that there are ways to build support for something. And he is a true believer that this is a da Vinci. Um, so he starts with the one person in the world that he believes probably would agree that this could be a da Vinci. It's Luke Sison at the National Gallery. So Luke Sison convenes the noted experts from Martin Kemp at Oxford to Carmen Bombach at the Met and a few others. And they come together and they have a quiet moment with this picture. And uh, you know, they they come together and you know, this is essentially, you know, every generation has its five or six key folks who um, determine who who actually is the right person to attribute a picture to and who these are the people that actually decide value. Um, on the heels of this, uh, remarkably, Luke Sison at the National Gallery decides to let the picture in the 2011 retrospective. People do agree that it is a da Vinci. Enough people at that moment where it uh, really got a baptism. And this was the key moment. This was the key moment that the picture became valuable because suddenly a national, international noted museum like the National Gallery in London, backed by a few opinions who really do matter, and suddenly that intellectual gulf could be bridged and people can start believing and, and accepting that this is by the hand of the master. Um, shortly thereafter, actually not shortly thereafter, uh, you know, he brings in an equity partner and they sell the picture to Yves Bouvier, who is a Freeport magnate. Uh, Yves Bouvier um, buys the picture for $83 million. Nice return for Robert Simon. Uh, he probably was, you know, they were hoping to get 200 million. Five days later, Eve sells it to Dmitry Rybolovlev on the left uh, for $127.5 million, pocketing $50 million for himself. Uh, uh, Rubilovlev discovers that he had been had. He discovers, and the movie goes into this a little bit, that he was being taken advantage of by who he thought was his advisor, but who his advisor was actually buying the inventory and then flipping for a very large profit to his client. And so they sue each other. Rubilovlev sues Yves Bouvier in court, but the only way he could actually show that he was harmed was he needed to demonstrate there was an actual loss. So Rubilovlev decides, I'm going to take this picture to Christie's. This is 2017. And I need to thread a needle. I need to lose money on this picture so I can demonstrate to the courts that I was ripped off by Yves Bouvier. But I want to get enough chips off the table so it's not a complete loss. So Christie's agrees to give him a $100 million guarantee. They guarantee the picture for $100 million, meaning um, Christie's, even if the bidding went up to, say, 80, Christie's would still pay Rubilovlev $100 million. Christie's did this deal in the summer. The picture wasn't to be sold until November. So they didn't want to sit with $100 million of risk on their books. So they went to a third party backer, a third party collector who would take the guarantee. And this third party ended up doing a deal where he got a very nice upside, meaning every dollar above that 100 million, he would get 
35% of the upside split line, which is interesting. So, you know, the picture comes to Christie's and it hammers down for 40 million plus $50 million in fees, making it the most valuable picture ever sold in the history of the world. Uh, interestingly, the, the, the person that really uh, made out that night, sure, Ribolovlev accidentally made a couple hundred million for himself, a first world problem to have. Christie's did okay, but not great with the picture. They made some money on it. But it was that third party guarantor, uh, a person from the Far East who backed the picture, ended up pocketing $125 million for himself that night. Didn't buy or sell the picture. Um, this is another thing. You, uh, the way pictures are sold at auction now are very different. The marketing video that Christie's did was brilliant. And Christie's recognized this idea that we were talking about, intellectual or aesthetic. They knew that the individual who would buy this picture, it was not going to be an aesthetic prize. It was going to be something around power and legacy. So they made this brilliant video, their marketing video, where they never actually showed the Salvador money. They showed people having an emotional reaction to the picture because they recognized that the way the Mona Lisa became the most famous picture in the world was not because of its formalist aspect or, you know, it's, it's, you know, perfect line or, you know, the sfumato or all these connoisseurship elements of it. It became a global icon because it was stolen in the early 20th century, it came to America, the Kennedy mystique. You know, they, they recognized they had to market this thing like the Mona Lisa as a global celebrity. So they even had Leonardo DiCaprio in their video having a moment with this picture. Uh, really brilliant because they didn't wanna present it as an old master uh, and get into all these sort of connoisseurship discussions. They wanted to market it as a celebrity. And they did that very well. They were appealing to people's intellect, not their aesthetic sensibilities. And ultimately, you know, the buyer, back to our little chart here, you know, the connoisseur had owned it once, the esthete owned it once. The buyer really was trophy hunter. Uh, and the buyer turned out to be uh, Prince bin Salman of Saudi Arabia, who had just overthrown his family in a coup not a few months prior and you know, decides to buy this picture, uh, really, we think, to, as the Mona Lisa, the Middle East Mona Lisa. And I think he may have underpaid. If you think you know, 450 million, which is you know, a blip of maybe a day's worth of oil wealth for uh, you know, the Islamic Republic there, um, he needs to prepare the country for post-oil. He needs to diversify his economy. He needs a global soft power strategy where art and culture will be at the center of that, both because he needs to soften his edge after you know, ordering the murder of Khashoggi. He also needs to uh, you know, present Saudi Arabia to the world as you know, a cultural destination. So if this picture uh, ends up in the National Museum in Riyadh and say it attracts one or two million visitors a year, you know, the, the Louvre gets almost 10 million visitors a year and about 60% of the visitors say they go to see one picture of the Mona Lisa. That's true uh, of this, you know, the most famous, uh, you're the most expensive painting ever sold in the world and for and the most debated right now. Uh, if it ends up in the Middle East, uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the payback period on this thing in terms of its economic impact for uh, Saudi Arabia is very quick. So um, value for them is not necessarily value for all of us. It's still debated. Um, it will be debated for generations, but I think the debate is narrow. Uh, you know, the top Leonardo scholars are mostly debating whether it's a Leonardo or a pupil, or is this a studio picture where Leonardo has had his hand in it a little bit. It really is no longer viewed as, oh, this is, nowhere near da Vinci, this is a late copy, this is a fake, it's a piece of garbage. There are some loud voices contending that, um, but I don't think the serious, serious scholarship right now um, does not take this picture. It, it's a picture that needs to be contended with, uh, and the Louvre was fully behind it, um, which is interesting. So with that, uh, look, 
what a crazy story. This picture's journey continues. Uh, it's been, you know, a pawn in a game between oligarchs and Freeport magnets. It's been a picture debated by scholars. It's been a discovery picture where, uh, you know, it was brought to life through conservation and, you know, uh, and research. And then ultimately, you know, the picture was launched into the stratosphere by two museums, both the Louvre and the National Gallery, uh, allowing it to be in their retrospective, even though it never actually made it into the Louvre retrospective. And here it sits, probably in a vault somewhere in Saudi Arabia, and pretty soon will be unveiled um, by the Saudis and will be a pillar of their soft power. Uh, so with that, Jackie, we can open it up for questions. I could go through some of them, um, unless you have some questions that you've seen come through. Uh, I think if you look at the chat, you can see people have some really interesting questions. Can you click on the chat? Yes, yes. yes. Let, me, let me bring. Okay, uh, how many experts agree and how many disagree? Interestingly, every generation has, let's say, a group of experts. Every, the art market is literally hundreds of thousands of submarkets. So if you were to buy a Rothko, there are two or three really important Rothko experts that you would, um, Leonardo da Vinci, there is a group of scholars, mostly in Europe, although there are a couple of scholars here in the United States who matter. Um, you know, we're talking Nicholas Penny you know, at the National Gallery, Martin Kemp at Oxford, uh, you know, others. And I would say, a good there's there's enough of them who are full believers in this picture and quietly even the folks who really contend think there's a very good chance it's a leonardo we just need more time and i think a lot of the scholars have been put off by uh you know the torturous route this picture has taken and how it's become such a financial tool for the super rich that i think that has put you know, some scholars uh, to be even more aggressively against this picture. Um, let's see, what, what else do we have here? Um, I'm gonna bring the, um, I am sure the provenant, let me bring the, um, I lost my, uh, my Yeah, shape. so uh, there's a question, can artificial intelligence be used for correct attribution? Well, it's interesting. In the film, we, we had interviewed a, a group that did an artificial intelligence analysis of the picture. Uh, the problem with that, artificial intelligence requires data. Uh, you know, artificial intelligence is a computer software program that's getting smarter by having lots of throughput. Meaning, you know, when, when you go on Netflix, you're, the AI behind it is learning about you what you're interested in, uh, what your sensibilities are. And based on more and more data, based on you clicking things, it's getting better and better in knowing what movies to give to you. Leonardo, it's very difficult. There's only 15 extant works that, uh, in Leonardo's Oak, and they're all very different. And his style, it, he was kind of a lazy guy. And his style really shifts every 10 years and so it's very difficult to, for AI to really look at this. Uh, I will say scientific evidence puts it in the 1500s. Um, you know, all the pigments are right, the wood's right. Um, you know, scientific analysis checks out very well with it. Uh, I have a question. Um, can you tell us how you went from being a naval intelligence officer to the front lines of the international art market? Yeah, look, I, it really isn't, there, there's no connection between chapter one and chapter two. I, I, I was a naval intel officer, spent most of my time in the Middle East and you know, got out and wanted to do something that I could apply some behavioral economic lessons to. I went to Oxford and studied that a little bit and I was fascinated by the art market. But the art market is a very strange ecosystem because it doesn't behave like classical economics. Classical economics would say as uh, demand for something, or as price goes up, the demand for something would go down. Uh, art is a little different. Oftentimes, as the price of something goes up, demand goes up with it. Economists call this a, the Giffen good. Um, because there's status, there's cultural capital, there's social um, capital. A lot of people buy art for non-economic reasons. 
And it's an eco ecosystem that behaves in very strange ways. Uh, and we could do another talk on unpacking all of that. But I wanted to kind of understand, is it rational? And I actually do believe the art market does have rational principles that it operates on. It's just very different from things like milk or butter. There are a lot of questions about uh, restoration and retouching and how that affects mm -hmm. the value. Can you talk, talk about that? Yeah, uh, look, in the old masters field, um, normally a picture that was heavily conserved with lots of damage, that would actually sort of you know, lower the value than if this was in perfect condition. Uh, people don't want a lot of the hand. I mean, there's a joke in the art market that the reason this was sold as a contemporary work of art is because most of what you're seeing is the hand of Diane Modestini, the conservation artist. But I think she did a brilliant job. Uh, you know, two principles of conservation art is that one, everything you do needs to be reversible. And you know, two, everything you do needs to be reversible. Those are the two most important things in the world because you want to give the next generation, if there's advances in technology, a chance to remove what you've done. So everything she's done to this picture is reversible. But when you look into the eyes of the Salvador Mundi, you are seeing a lot of her hand in it. And particularly the face, which was heavily damaged, you're seeing really, really great work by a very good conservation expert, which sort of lends itself to you know, the value of this, um, it became the last opportunity in any of our lifetime to buy a work by Leonardo da Vinci, the most important artist of the Renaissance. And so this is a very unique situation. It's likely we'll never see a da Vinci painting come to market again in our lifetime. And if it really is a da Vinci, uh, the, the conservation work became of secondary nature. This became a an icon, a masterpiece that you only had one shot. So countries and oligarchs and Chinese rich and hedge fund magnets were gonna you know, go after this thing. Uh, I found fascinating in the film, um, the, the woman who you turned to to touch up the painting or restore it, found a very similar similarity between uh, the lip of in this painting and the Mona Lisa. Can you talk about that? I mean, that was something that really convinced her that it was a Leonardo. Yeah, Diane Modestini, who was the conservation artist on this thing, she was married to uh, Mario Modestini, who he was a da Vinci scholar. He vetted the Genova da Vinci, which is the only da Vinci in the Western hemisphere. It hangs at the National Gallery in um, Washington, DC. And you know, when they showed him this picture, he was 99 at the time and he had, he's since passed away, but he perked up and he saw something very interesting. And uh, you know, the, the key moment for uh, Diane as she's doing the work is she sees the transition in the lip. Uh, she studied the Mona Lisa very intently as she was doing her conservation work. And she saw that the line was imperceptible. You know, this, you know, the smokiness of you know, the sfumato effect that uh, da Vinci is famous for using. She saw that in the transition between the lip to sort of the upper lip. And she was absolutely convinced at that moment that it must be by the hand of Leonardo. Uh, another question, how much of focus do US or other intelligence agencies uh, focus on the art market as a method of wealth transfer? Despite our film, bringing in FBI and CIA, you know, look, when you make a movie, uh, you always got to make sure you add some flair to it to make it even more dramatic and interesting and try and, you know, build a box office following. The reality is our, our intelligence communities are not very focused on art. The FBI does have an art crimes division and they, they do deal in stolen art. Uh, which is sometimes used by drug cartels and other as collateral or blackmail. Um, when we get to the CIA and sort of some of our you know, national intelligence organizations, they spend very little time chasing works of art around. Uh, they're, they're more concerned. Now, if this was sort of a pawn in some you know, global anti-money laundering scheme or you know, terrorist financing scheme, it would, you know, it would get a quick look. Uh, but it's not a key focus from our intel community. 
Can you talk about the relationship between banking and art, which I think goes back to the Medici's? Yeah, look, I, I always find it funny because you, every month there's an article sort of bemoaning the financialization of the art market and the art world. And it, now it's became a cruddy game for the, the super rich. You know, people who say that are being a little ahistorical because if you go back to the Renaissance, it was the bankers at the time, the fuggers and the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the Medici, you know, they were basically supporting artists of their day to stay in the good graces of the Catholic church. Um, they were using art to show their humanity. They were, uh, you know, they were collecting art and, you know, in many ways they were doing it both to show their power and humanity. And so this is not too different, even in the Dutch golden age, you know, you look at the, the art market at the time, you know, it was a lot of burgers and, you know, some of the Dutch elite that had made money um, with their invention of the stock market. Yeah, you know, they were buying and selling pictures and art lending at the time was created. And so anywhere money and capital goes, the art market's there with it. In the 19th century, it was London. In the 20th century, a post-war it became New York City. So art has always had this uneasy love affair with money. And expense and great art has always been expensive throughout history for whatever philosophical reason um, in Western civilization in particular, we valued great objects. And that's probably good because that means they've been conserved. Um, where we're at now is um, it's become an asset class to a degree. I oversee a $9 billion art lending book, meaning there's about $18 billion worth of art held by our collectors. We unlock capital from it so they can redeploy it into their hedge fund or their private equity fund. We do a lot of deals at auction structuring guarantees. We manage museum endowments. So it's become a little bit more mature. Question, how about NFTs? How do you ascribe value to them? Well, look, maybe you should define them a little bit. Yeah, we're in the very early stages. This is a new segment of the art market. And, you know, a lot of people buying NFTs are not art collectors. It, it's really also a new segment of, you know, the broader financial system. Um, so there's, there's the NFT collectors that are diversifying their crypto wallet meaning they have a wallet of Ethereum and Bitcoin and Dogecoin. And there's actually not a lot of things in the world you can spend those things on, um, but you can buy NFTs, these non-fungible tokens. And that same social status, cultural capital structure that has been built around the art market, where you, Mr. and Mrs. Collector, inviting your friends over to your Bel Air apartment and showing off your Rothko or your Picasso, in the digital world, in the metaverse, uh, you know, these you know, digital natives being able to point to the blockchain and say, I own this non-fungible token of this crypto punk or this board ape. It's very strange, but there's a lot of status in being able to point to that. So ownership, even in this digital domain means something for their own sort of status <laughs> uh, sensibility. So NFTs are here to stay. We're more excited about the underlying technology, uh, blockchain, as well as the smart contract on the Ethereum network. Because what a smart contract can do, when you buy a non-fungible token, it's on the Ethereum network. So you, you buy it with Ethereum and it's on a blockchain and it's sort of on this digital ledger. And you can, with a smart contract, say every time this is resold, 10% of its value will go back to the artist or the museum, or myself. You can make a smart contract where the NFT has children in 10 years, meaning the work of art is programmed to in 10 years produce three more works of art that you will now have. Um, so we're very excited about the ramifications for intangible property like music and IP and trademarks and digital things like tweets and things that exist only in the digital realm. There's gonna be a massive secondary market for all of this. And you're, when I grew up in college, you know, I was on Facebook, my kids, and it's scary, and it's probably going to destroy all of their, uh, you know, psychological well-being, but 
they're all going to have their avatars and their avatars are going to be in the metaverse and they're going to have their real life, but they're going to have their own avatar lives and they're going to be dating and they're going to be buying avatar things. And it's going to be very weird. So, you know, you're going to see a lot of people buying and selling things that only exist in a digital world. And NFTs is just the first wave of this. It's a question. Will the art market collapse or implode like the stock market does periodically? It goes in cycles. The last mega collapse we had was in the early 90s. It, the art market is driven at the high end by a very small number of individuals. I mean, it's minuscule, you know, in the hundreds, maybe now in the thousands. So when the Japanese in the late 80s, you know, had their recession and, you know, a lot of the big Japanese collectors left the market, it had a, a domino effect where we really had a collapse. Um, and after the Gulf War, you know, it further, and it closed up. I mean, it was a very sharp, severe decline. But what happens in the art market, unlike other markets, uh, it's a very strange supply demand dynamic. Uh, when the art market, when liquidity dries up, people opt not to sell unless they really have to. Uh, in a similar vein, we saw during COVID, uh, we had a severe supply constraint. People didn't want to sell because they didn't know, you know what was happening. And so you had severe supply constraints, which actually held prices up because demand stayed steady. Um, so yes, we will go through a cycle where there's probably a big macroeconomic impact like rising interest rates. Because when interest rates go up, the opportunity cost of owning a cash negative asset like art that doesn't pay you a dividend, that goes up. And the, and the cost of getting the capital out of your art goes up. So as interest rates go up, you're going to see less capital going into art, which probably will put pressure on the value of art. Um, with that said, if we have extreme, if we have extreme um, you know, price increases, you know, writ large throughout the economy through inflation, art is actually a pretty good hedge against that. So uh, art's a sentiment asset. And the biggest driver is, is there liquidity at the ultra high end of the wealth spectrum? And when there is, art does well. When we don't have that, art does less well. Uh, the movie touches on this and you mentioned it, uh, the Freeport Magnate, what the sort of the mm -hmm. shadowy storage areas that yeah. That was art that nobody ever sees. Yeah, look, free ports are special economic zones. They exist in places like Geneva, Switzerland, or Luxembourg, or Singapore. And, you know, movies like Tenet and other things, people think these are just money laundering nodes, but they're less interesting than that. They are a place where, because they are at a, you know, a node, which is usually a transportation hub, they, they tend to, they, they, they're not uh, subject to that taxes. So if you put a work of art in a free port and you sell it to someone down the hall in the free port, you don't have to pay local taxes, VAT taxes, you know, you know, capital gains taxes, et cetera, as long as the work stays in the free port. The moment you bring it out of the free port, all those taxes are applied to it. So the reason free ports are very useful for luxury objects and art dealers is because they do a lot of buying and selling, and they can do that amongst other art dealers and collectors in the free port without the immediate tax impact on it. But the moment those works come out, you know, normal taxes are applied. So a free port's a special economic zone that is useful for folks who want to store luxury goods. So if this is proven to be a fake. Uh, could that happen? How would that go? How would that happen? And would the money go back to the purchaser? Proven is a very, very severe word for this. I, I, the only way it would be proven is if we found a better Salvador Mundi that was clearly by Da Vinci. We know Da Vinci painted a Salvador Mundi because we have a lot of sketches that are in the Buckingham collection that da Vinci did drawings of the sleeve and everything. So we knew he was working on one at some point. Um, a lot of folks believe this is that picture. If we found a better picture that was clearly by da Vinci, then that would prove it. Um, that's unlikely to happen. So what we're left with is a connoisseurship debate amongst scholars 
And this generation scholars believe it's a da Vinci. There are some people who aren't all the way there, but a good bit of them are. Next generation scholars can be in a completely different spot. Tintoretta's turned into Titians and museums and vice versa. And that could happen to this picture. Scholarly consensus could shift. Um, but Christie's, no, they, they, the only way Christie's would be on the hook is I think they have a five-year window where unless it was proved to be an out-and-out -out late fake, uh, they would have to refund the buyer, but that's not going to happen. Well, Evan, thank you so much. This is fascinating. Um, I urge everyone to watch the film. Uh, it's, it's great. Uh, well, hey, thanks for having me, and uh, good to see everyone and have fun at the Larchmont Library. Thank you. Appreciate it. We'll see you. Bye-bye.